Thank you very much, Father. I'd like to thank you for the warm welcome and the introduction. Good evening, everybody. Colonel Newman chose as his motto, Cor at Cor Loquito, Heart Speaks to Heart. So, in the spirit of Cor at Cor, I too welcome you for coming here this evening to reflect a bit on Newman's, Cardinal Newman's Anglican and Catholic Mariology. It might come as a surprise to someone not thoroughly familiar with the life of John Henry Newman that the Anglican priest who disfavored Catholic excesses in Marian devotion had a strong personal love and devotion to Mary. An early Anglican influence on Newman was Harold Froude, an Anglican priest and early leader of the Oxford movement. Newman was particularly attracted to Froude's interest in the Blessed Virgin Mary. This was new and enticing for Newman. He says that Freud fixed deep in me the idea of devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Looking back on his life in the 1820s and the 1830s, although he spoke and wrote about the Pope as the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church as being bound up with the cause of the Antichrist, Newman acknowledges his personal devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary when he writes in Apologia. In spite of my ingrained fears of Rome, yet I had a secret longing and love of Rome, the mother of English Christianity, and I had a true devotion to the Blessed Virgin in whose college I lived, whose altar I served, and whose immaculate purity I had in one of my earliest printed sermons made much of. He was referring to Oriel College under its true name, House of Blessed Mary the Virgin. Oriel is a nickname for the college. His Marian devotion was to the mother of Jesus. He was not yet comfortable with the title Mother of God, and he affectionately referred to Mary as Our Lady. Despite that, he did not favor Roman Catholic expressions of devotion to Mary. He said, the more I grew in devotion to the saints and Our Lady, the more impatient I was with Roman practices. There is an old Latin adage applied to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Maria Nunquam Satis which means that one cannot do enough to or for Mary, nor say enough about Mary. <coughs> Roman Catholics were augmenting Marian celebrations and outpourings of affection, thinking that Mary deserved ever more love and devotion. Mary was being given title upon title in litanies and prayers, and she was being endowed with immense prerogatives and attributes by Catholics who regarded Mary as mother virgin, queen, benefactor, intercessor, mediatrix, and co-redemptrix. There was nothing that Mary could not do because of her powerful intercession with God. Many Roman Catholics directly prayed to Mary rather than to pray, rather than pray to God through the intercession of Mary. The sacred liturgy of the Mass often became the time and place for rosaries and novenas to the Blessed Virgin Mary and other forms of Marian devotion. Roman Catholic Marian practices were becoming <coughs> excessive, practices that go back to the ensuing years of the Counter-Reformation when Protestants and Roman Catholics became embroiled in the bitter polemics of minimizing versus maximizing Marian devotion. 
The more Catholics did and said about Mary, the less Protestants, on the contrary, and in reaction, did and said concerning Mary. Hence the more or less in the title of tonight's presentation, Mary, more or less, in the Anglican Catholic Mariology of John Henry Cardinal Newman. Minimizing Marian devotion and expression in, in the Church of England did not mean that 19th century England was devoid of Marian devotion. Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary was a reality in the Church of England, even though it played a very minor and insignificant role in the devotional life of the Church of England. The existence of a statue of the Blessed Virgin and the Child Jesus since 1637 on the exterior facade of a prominent church on High Street in Oxford, the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, attested to the reverence paid to the Mother of Jesus in England. The Church of St. Mary the Virgin was the University Church of Oxford where Newman served as vicar for 18 years from 1828 to 1843. For his part, Newman exercised restraint in Mariology. His own Marian devotion as an Anglican was also cautiously veiled in doctrine which was both scriptural and patristic. Mariology for him was foremost incarnational. It was Christ-centered, Christocentric, grounded in scripture and affirmed by the fathers of the church. He recognized that Anglicans shared a lot more in common with Catholics about the Virgin Mary than Anglicans would admit. Newman was also convinced that some Roman Catholic Marian doctrines and devotions were novelties and without apostolic foundation and did not pertain to the early Christian church. There were examples of what he called the intolerable offense of having added to the faith. The idea that Catholic Marian devotion seemed idolatrous was one that concerned Newman very much. He acknowledged that while the Church of England has certain imperfections, the Church of Rome has certain corruptions. And if the Church of England glories in what looks like schism, then the Roman Catholic Church practices what looks very much like idolatry. He says, For this reason, because if the note of schism on the one hand lies against England, an antagonist disgrace lies upon Rome, the note of idolatry. Let us not be mistaken here. We are neither accusing Rome of being idolatrous nor ourselves of being schismatical. We think neither charge tenable, but still the Roman Church practices what looks so much like idolatry, and the English Church glories in what looks so much like schism. Nevertheless, as an Anglican priest, faithful to the teachings of the Church of England, and yet suspicious of the Church of Rome, John Henry Newman cautiously avoided and reluctantly criticized Roman Catholic practices which to him, which to him seemed corrupt and idolatrous. He was later to write in Apologia that although he did not enjoy his criticisms of the Roman Church, his protestations were done out of a sense of Anglican duty and to protect himself against the charge of popery. This placed Newman in agreement with other Anglicans who regarded Mariology as Mariolatry. Roman Catholic devotion to Mary epitomized all that was wrong and corrupt within the Roman Church. Thus, Anglicans thought that Marian celebrations would bring about the demise of the Catholic Church. 
Writing a theological tract in 1836, tract number 71, on the, mod, on the mode of conducting the controversy with Rome, Newman highlighted from an Anglican viewpoint factors that could be considered false in Catholic belief and condemned devotional reverence to the Virgin Mary. He was negative and critical of certain honors being paid to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he particularly condemned some Catholic authors who were attributing a certain amount of omnipotence to Mary. According to his prerogative of omnipotence, Mary, as mother of God, was able to command her son Jesus with a maternal authority to the extent that Jesus could never refuse anything she asked of him. Newman was concerned that this tended to put Mary on the same level with Jesus in terms of omnipotence. For Newman, worship and honor were due to God alone and he felt that Roman Catholic Marian devotion was distracting from divine worship. For him, Marian devotion, as well as veneration of saints and angels, were idolatrous. He was convinced that every feeling which interferes with God's sovereignty in our hearts is, an, is of an idolatrous nature. These sentiments lasted up to 1843, and even then, when he was on the verge of breaking with the Anglican Church and thinking of becoming a Catholic, he wrote in Apologia that, I could not go to Rome while she suffered honors to be paid to the Blessed Virgin and the Saints, which I thought in my conscience to be incompatible with the supreme incommunicable glory of the one infinite and eternal God. From this pulpit in the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, Newman preached to standing room only for the University of Oxford uh, community. And as Father alluded to earlier, he did this on a nightly basis for about an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. Newman preached a sermon about Mary on the Feast of the Annunciation in 1832, the honor due to the Virgin Mary. In 1838, he preached another Annunciation Feast sermon, the reverence due to the Blessed Virgin. This sermon best portrays Newman's Anglican Mariology, in which he extols Mary's dignity and holiness and also introduces the theme of Mary as the new Eve, or the second Eve, which pervades his Mariology. Ascribing to biblical and Christocentric Mariology, it could be said that contrary to the more or less Catholic Protestant polemic earlier depicted, the paradox of less is more captures the spirit and essence of Newman's love and devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary as an Anglican Protestant diminution of Mary became restricted to the few instances in which scripture which refers to Mary. Newman used the Protestant sola scriptura and the silence of, of scripture, tacit scriptura, in a way that supported the paradoxical condition that less is more by showing that the silence of scripture concerning the Virgin Mary is expressive. Mary was mentioned at Christ's incarnation, at his birth, in his childhood and education, during his ministry, at his death, and on the day of Pentecost with the apostles in prayer. Newman concluded by saying, thus, she is constantly brought before our minds, and even yet nothing is told about her. We are to reverence her memory for her sake. This was not a shift away from his more frequent expressions for the sake of Jesus, or for the sake of her son, or for the sake of Emmanuel, as he said in his discourse entitled The Glorious 
of Mary for the sake of her son. Consequently, aware of Anglican sensitivity to all things Marian, Newman realized that all that could be said about Mary should not be said. But regardless of the silence of scripture, whatever could be said about the Virgin Mary should be geared carefully to developing in our hearts the image of her son. A statement like this is significant for his theory of development because even at this time, even if his essay on development of Christian doctrine had not yet been written, he must have been thinking about the correlation of devotion to Mary and its positive outcome in the worship of her divine son. In the essay, Newman says that true devotion to Mary does not take away from devotion to God. He was convinced that Marian devotion led to growth and development in Christian worship of God, and he points out that the times and the places that Mary was dishonored are the times and places that Jesus was not worshipped. And the times and the places that Mary was honored are the times and places that Jesus was worshipped. The Christocentric basis of Newman's Mariology is also a factor that cautioned him to be restrained and to say less about Mary. To this effect, he says in the sermon, since these times are heartless and unbelieving and your hearts profane, I shall say no more, lest I should say more than we can bear. As cautious as he was not to say much about Mary, he said enough that would later on create difficulties for him with his fellow Anglicans who accused him of holding the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. In this sermon about Mary's transcendent purity, her grace and holiness, which set her apart in order to be the mother of Christ, he says, who can estimate the holiness and perfection of her who was chosen to be the mother of Christ. What must have been the transcendent purity of her whom the Creator, Spirit, con 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 condesc condescended to overshadow with his miraculous presence? What must have been her gifts who was chosen to be only near earthly relative of the Son of God. The pondering of Mary in her heart is very significant and relevant to tonight's Faith and Reason Human Center Lecture. On the Feast of the Purification of Mary in 1443, in 1843, sorry, Newman preached a sermon before the University of Oxford community which dealt with his theory of development in religious doctrine. This sermon, although not per se Marian, is an example of his personal development in Marian doctrine. The general ideas of Newman's theory of development in religious doctrine came from this sermon which he based on, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Thus, the pondering of Mary was the locus for the development of faith. Newman says, Thus, St. Mary is our pattern of faith, both in the reception and in the study of divine truth. She does not think it enough to accept, she dwells upon it. Not enough to possess, she uses it. Not enough to assent, she develops it. Not enough to submit the reason, she reasons upon it. Not indeed reasoning first and believing afterwards. 
Newman's choice of pondering of the pondering of Mary within her heart as a scriptural theme for a theory of development in religious doctrine is both significant and symbolic. Mary was blessed because she believed. Her faith came first. The developed reasoning came afterwards as a result of her pondering. While Zacharias questioned the angel's message, Mary pondered on what the message meant. While Zacharias, who first reasons, then believes, Mary believes even without reasoning, but in the end reasoning only after believing. It was not enough for Mary to receive and to possess divine truth, but to develop it and to reason on it. While others wondered at the words of the shepherd, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. When the boy Jesus told Mary and Joseph after they found him in the temple that he must be about his father's business, Mary stored up and pondered all these things in her heart. In her prayerful pondering, Newman continued to show that Mary's internalizing of all that she had been told and had seen concerning her divine son was first accepted in faith, and in her pondering, she thought to understand the divine message. In this sermon, Newman continued to show that Mary the pattern of our faith was also a model of the faith of all believers. She symbolizes to us not only the faith of the unlearned, but of the doctors of the church also, who have to investigate and to weigh and to define, as well as to profess the gospel, to draw the line between truth and heresy. The pondering of Mary in her heart was developmental. Pondering in faith leads to deepening in faith, which is also developmental. Newman portrays Mary as a model for development. Mary stands as a paradigm of faith to reason, and it is through Mary's example that Newman thinks we should turn our thoughts in order that we might learn the use of reason in investigating the doctrines of faith. Reason has enhanced faith in many ways. It has only submitted to faith, but has ministered to faith. It has illustrated its documents. It has raised illiterate peasants into philosophers and divines. It has elicited a meaning from their words, which their immediate hearers little suspected. Newman thus in the relation of faith and reason, upheld the Blessed Virgin Mary to be our example on the use of reason in investigating the doctrines of faith. The essence of Newman's Anglican Mariology lay in the blessedness, holiness, the faith, and the obedience of the mother of Jesus. A starting point for Mary's blessedness is the Annunciation greeting of the angel Gabriel's words, Healing Mary, full of grace. Mary's blessedness was also proclaimed by her cousin when Elizabeth in her greeting said in a loud voice to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. A second time Elizabeth said about Mary, Blessed is she that believed. Then Mary herself in her Magnificat said, For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Later on, in a discourse address to mixed congregations, Drawing on his patristic heritage, Newman would link Mary's blessedness with her faith, faith and say, More blessed was Mary, says St. Augustine, in receiving Christ's faith than in conceiving Christ's flesh. 
he would also refer to St. John Chrysostom's declaration that she would not have been blessed though she had borne him in his body had she not heard the word of God and kept it. Mary's faithful obedience is seen and Newman notes when he cites Jesus' response of yea, rather, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it to the woman who called out to him, blessed the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. Through this response, Jesus was affirming that his mother Mary was his mother not simply because she bore him, but she was his mother because in faith and obedience she heard and listened to God's word. In other words, Mary would not have been his mother if she did not listen to and obey God's word. Newman also cited another gospel passage where Mary at a wedding at Cana tells the servants to do whatever he tells you to do. This shows the progression from Mary's reception of divine truth in her heart as development takes place. She ponders long on it and it was developing in her heart until she was ready to put her faith into action by telling the apostles to do whatever he tells them to do. Mary was blessed among women because of her holiness. She was holy because she was the mother of the incarnate Son of God. No one was closer to Jesus than his mother. Christ derived his manhood from her and so had an, a special unity of nature with her. Mary's nature was human nature. Though by nature a sinner, she was holy and sinless, having been raised above the condition of sinful being. Newman's thoughts reveal a slight ambivalence between the sinlessness of Mary and her being of sinful nature. In one breath, he would say, Mary was a sinner as others and born of sinners. And in another breath, he would quickly add that she was set apart to yield a created nature to him who was her creator. There was no vagueness in his mind that in receiving human nature from Mary, Christ is really partaker of our nature, and in all respects, man saves sin only. Ian Kerr <coughs> writes that the equivocation over Mary's sinfulness is highly significant, as Newman had already glimpsed the need for a doctrine like the Immaculate Conception. God would have chosen no less than the holiness and the purity of Mary for his coming into the world. Mary's holiness surpassed that of all creatures. Who can estimate the holiness and perfection of her who was chosen to be the mother of Christ? Later on, as a Roman Catholic, Newman openly referred to Mary as the mother of God. As an Anglican, his preferred way of speaking of Mary's maternity was the mother of Jesus. However, it is remarkable that as an Anglican, Newman would at times openly refer to the mother of Jesus as the mother of God. In a Christmas sermon in 1825, Newman referred to Mary as a daughter of man who became the mother of God. In 1832, he attributed Mary's holiness to her nearness to God and said, everybody, except heretics, have ever called Mary the mother of God. With all this Anglican emphasis on less rather than more about Mary, the above mentioned Marian themes in Newman's Anglican Mariology are remarkable for a time when Marian theology and devotion were minimized in England. Michael O'Carroll, sums up the Anglican Mariology of Newman in these words.
Between 1832 and 1845, this Anglican, who was emerging as a great religious re leader, developed a theology of Mary, not only an example in his own communion, but superior to most contemporary thinking on the subject in the Catholic or Orthodox churches. Newman's Mariology as a Catholic. Newman, a Roman Catholic Marian devotee. As a Catholic priest, he championed Marian doctrine and devotion as fitting. He was instrumental in bringing many of his fellow Anglican priests and Tractarian friends to the Church of Rome. Newman was received into the Roman Catholic Church on the 9th of October, 1845, and was ordained a priest in Rome in 1847. A focal point of Newman's Catholic Mariology was the doctrine of the Second Eve, which he first made mention of in a sermon in 1832, the reverence due to the Virgin Mary. For Newman, the doctrine of the Second Eve was the great rudimentary teaching of antiquity from its earliest date in the writings of the Fathers. Newman cites St. Justin Martyr, a dialogue with Trifo, and St. Ignatius of Lyon against the heresies as second century sources for the doctrine of the Second Eve. Now, it must be pointed out that while both Justin and Irenaeus drew a parallel between Eve's disobedience and Mary's obedience, neither of them actually spoke about Mary as a second Eve. Nevertheless, if St. Irenaeus were alive today, he might agree that all he wrote about the Blessed Virgin Mary could all be summed up in the phrase, a second or a new Eve. Mary's role in redemption is best gleaned from Newman's patristic study of Mary as the second Eve. The second Eve or the new Eve became the lenses through which Newman understood and made sense of his Marian doctrine and devotion. In Newman's Catholic Mariology, the doctrine of Mary's dignity as mother and queen, her sanctity, her immaculate conception and assumption derive from the centrality of the doctrine of the second Eve. The first Eve, the companion of Adam, was not much spoken of and her role not much reflected upon outside of any discussion of her role in relation to that of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Thus, we understand these two virgins better when we compare their roles in the mystery of salvation. Eve was often betrayed as a temptress and a seducer of Adam, and although in the first covenant she had a definite and an essential position, the fate of the human race lay with Adam, and it was in Adam that we all fell. Eve listened to the evil angel and allowed herself to be seduced. She cooperated, not as an irresponsible instrument, but intentionally and personally in sin. She brought it about as a real agent. She was a positive, active cause of the fall of humanity and suffered in the punishment sentence against her. As a result, Mary, the second Eve, would be the mother of Christ, the second Adam, the Redeemer. In becoming the mother of the Son of God, Mary was not a mere physical instrument of the Incarnation. Instead, her role in the Incarnation was for the redemption in which she held an important position 
and that she was also viewed in this light from the earliest days of Christianity. Mary's role in the economy of redemption was fulfilled not only in spirit, but also in body. As Newman says, Mary's place in the economy of redemption was not only in our Lord having taken flesh from her and being her son, but moreover in that it is fulfilled in her spirit and, and will, as well as in her body. And the mother of the Redeemer, as the mother of the Redeemer, she was intimately connected with her son in his redemptive mission. In highlighting the parallelism between Adam and Christ, in the Marian context, depicting a, parallel, a parallelism between Eve and Mary, comparing and contrasting the two virgins, the first Eve with the second Eve, Newman drew on the testimony of St. Justin Martyr and St. Irenaeus, who referred to Mary through her obedience, repairing the damage done through the disobedience of Eve, thus closely associating Mary with Jesus in the work of redemption. Newman expounds this view when he continues. As Eve was the cause of ruin for all, Mary was the cause of salvation for all. As Eve made room for Adam's fall, so Mary made room for our Lord's reparation of it. And thus, whereas the free gift was not as the offense, but much greater, it follows that as Eve cooperated in effecting an evil deed, Mary cooperated in effecting a much greater good. Mary is not only a second Eve, but she is a better Eve. As Newman points out when he says, Mary is called by the Holy Fathers a second and a better Eve as having taken that first step in the salvation of mankind which Eve took in its ruin. That the mother of the incarnate Son of God is also mother of the Redeemer, that this was a new untrodden path which Newman wished to set out in his Mariology. However, it was clear in his mind that as the mother of the Redeemer, Mary was among the redeemed. His friend, Edward B. Pusey, on the one hand, was concerned that talk about Mary and her cooperation with the Redeemer would give her a role in redemption as a co-redeemer. Newman's response to this was, why should there be any objection to calling Mary co-redemptrix when Pusey himself is known to have called Mary, like the fathers themselves called her, by a multitude of titles such as Mother of God, Second Eve, and the like. In presenting the ancient Marian doctrine of Mary as second of a new Eve, Newman intended to show that the